Hello, everyone. Welcome to CMS. My name is Andres. My name is Sonia. And yeah, we're going to show you guys around the CMS detector today, at least the facilities. Uh, we are going to talk about the OXC and CMS and show you guys the underground areas. Unfortunately, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to show you the actual detector uh, since we have, uh, we're in a process of beam commissioning after a couple of Oh, interesting. So yes. we have a surprise for you guys. Yes. Okay. So this will be interesting. Um, so I think I'm going to pass it to Sonia and maybe you can say a word about yourself and yeah. Thank you very much, Anders. So uh, yes, my name is Sonia coming from uh, Italy. I'm the funny part of the, <laughs> of the team. <laughs> You will see, you will understand uh, during, uh, during the visit. Uh, I'm the, the one uh, who has been chosen to go underground, <laughs> cross fingers. And uh, I will try to show you, okay, the facility. And I will enjoy for you uh, the magnetic field. Uh, I will try to let you enjoy with me because I really enjoy, I know. Now, concerning me, I'm a particle physicist. I came here as a, a bachelor student to finish my thesis and then uh, guess I never went back to Italy <laughs> this is my destiny <laughs> and uh, then I found a, a PhD contract uh, here at University of Geneva and this made me became uh, an astroparticle physicist which basically is the same as a particle physicist the only thing is that the data are not coming from an accelerator but coming from the space uh, but apart this, okay, I'm uh, really a particle physicist. <laughs> okay, to you. All right, thank you, Sonia. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I'm Andres. I grew up in Puerto Rico, and I made my swell, myself, uh, made my way to the LHC, and uh, I've been working with CMS for a few years as a graduate student and now as a postdoc. And, yeah, I'm based here, and I work mainly on what we call luminosity measurements, and we can talk about that later. Uh, but maybe for now, we can just go ahead, maybe show, talk, to, talk about the LHC a little bit. Maybe we can show some slides. And... Uh, as I, I, I have to prepare myself, so uh, I think I will leave the floor to Andres here, and I will prepare myself to go underground. Okay, so see you in a few minutes. All right. Great. Um, so we, uh, yeah. I hope to give you guys a quick introduction uh, about the LHC. I think you guys have already a good idea of what the LHC is, but just uh, maybe as a very general way to describe it, you could say that this is the world's most powerful microscope. Uh, so what we're actually doing, we have this giant machine and we circulate protons, we collide protons, and we are actually trying to understand, describe, uh, trying to predict what happens at the smallest scales. And we're trying to understand what happens inside of the nucleus, but it's a bit more complicated than that, right? So we're trying to describe interactions between particles. And some of these particles don't exist in nature normally. So we have to essentially concentrate a lot of energy together. And you can say that we convert the kinetic energy into a uh, new mass. So you can just summon E equals MC squared and say, we use that energy to create particles that don't normally exist. And we want to study those particles. It's a bit like, imagine I say the universe is made of really tiny, small Legos. We're trying to identify which Legos exist and which are those fundamental Legos and that, how they fit together as well. So that's sort of generally what we're trying to do. And we have this giant machine. Uh, it's the Large Hadron Collider. It's got a lot of history. Uh, which I'll maybe talk about a little bit, but generally we have this, uh, this tunnel that's on average 100 meters underground, but it's actually not completely level, so it actually is slanted. And it's 27 kilometers in circumference, uh, which is, I think, 17 miles or so. Uh, I'll mostly be using the metric system because I don't know the numbers in uh, American units. Um, but yeah. We have several detectors at the LHC. Uh, Atlas and CMS are on opposite, opposite, opposite each other, let's say, in the tunnel. And here at CMS, we're in France, whereas Atlas is actually in Switzerland. So most of us actually cross the border every day 
to go to work, in fact, several times, uh, just to drive to CMS, for example. Uh, and we have other detectors such as LHCB and Atlas. Those are more specialized. And uh, sorry, I said Atlas. I mean LHCB and Elise. So uh, Atlas and CMS are more general detectors, and I'll try to describe what that means uh, in a minute. But Elise focuses on heavy ion collisions, and LHCB on focuses on uh, very, let's say, studies of symmetry and studies of uh, B quarks and that sort of thing. It's more specialized research, uh, but still very interesting. So um, I think Sonia is already making her way. Sonia, you can interrupt whenever you like. Um, but just uh, to continue and talk a bit about CMS a little bit more, uh, we have actually a very interesting. <laughs> uh, so so we, we always joke that this is our spare detector. So this is actually a one-to-one -one real, you know, one-to-one -one scale detector. And Andres? Actually, yes, go ahead. Uh, no, no, sorry, because you were frozen. Just okay. this. Okay. And now you asked me something? Because no, we are no, on no. the way. Sorry. Okay. I'll, I'll uh, okay. okay. I continue. Detector. I continue. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to point out is the scale. I want to point this out again, and I'll try to like get close to this uh, detector here. Uh, so this is kind of what we're talking about. This is uh, 15 meters tall. And what's me, I mean, now that we're here, so this detector is basically a cylindrical onion, and it's made up of different slices. So you can imagine you have a cylindrical onion, and you slice it into uh, a dozen or so slices. And each of them was actually assembled on the surface and then it was craned down uh, with specialized cranes because they're like the most lightweight of these slices was like three or 400 tons and it had to be lowered down exactly where we're standing. So this, I'm, I'm standing on a very, very thick concrete slab that covers a shaft, a hole in the ground that's 100 meters in depth. So one thing that's interesting since Andres, we're here, so, yes. Can I can I just interact with you? As I saw that you you have shown the picture of LHC, I have the chance to show something. Do you want to describe this uh, object? Sure. So I have a dipole here. Yeah, let's take a quick break and talk about the LHC dipoles. So the LHC has two main uh, two main elements. One accelerates the particles, and one. Uh, bends the particles so it keeps them or constrains them around the LHC ring. And this is a dipole magnet. It's a superconducting magnet that uh, is very, very powerful. It has to be cooled down to almost absolute zero to something like 2.7 Kelvin. It actually uses superfluid helium. And we have 1,232 1, of these dipoles to keep the protons around going around the tunnel. And this generates. Um, between seven and eight Tesla of magnetic field, which is quite a lot. But this is, and, and actually, Sonia, I've, I've never held one of these in my hand. This is really cool. So she's holding the beam. I, I didn't destroy LHC. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I hope that was a, a movable piece. Yes, but go on, go on. <laughs> yeah. So that's the beam screen, and this, this is part of what we call the beam pipe. Uh, so it's very, very interesting. Uh, and yeah, these, I, I just wanted to point out that these elements, these magnets, are what actually constrain the energy of the particles. Because so we can always give the particles more kick, but we need to keep them within or, or constrained to the tunnel. And you do that with very strong magnetic fields. And if you don't have enough magnetic field, the particles will just fly out of the tunnel. So this is the limiting factor for the energy of the tunnel. All right, thanks, Sonia. So I, I wanted to point out something here where we're standing really quick. Uh, so if you look at the image of the detector behind me, you can see uh, the edge of the detector. Uh, so, sorry, I need to open up. Right, so you can see the limit, right? The edge of the detector on the left and on the right. And you can see that where I'm standing, uh, the available space, the available area is very close in dimensions to the detector itself. So what I'm trying to say is that it was very expensive to dig this particular shaft. It actually required us to freeze the soil and uh, lots of other 
complicated things because there was a lot of running water. But in the end, we had this tunnel. And then when we were lowering each of the slices, we had under on the order of five or so centimeters on each side, very, very small amount of space for something that's hundreds of tons or even thousands of tons. And it's just, it always, you know, oscillates a little bit. So you need to be very, very careful during that operation. Uh, so a lot of people were very ner nervous while that was going on, but we successfully lowered the detector down to the experimental cavern, as we call it. Okay, so I think we are frozen right I now, guess. but maybe Sonia. Yeah, uh, no, I was just showing in the moment you were showing uh, the picture of, uh, of, the, of the CMS. I was showing the model we have. It's not the real <laughs> CMS detector. But now I, as I'm waiting for my safety guides, Noemi, uh, she will be with me. I'm just showing you parts of the control room, which is uh, basically the big room, which is split into, into sites. And we have here all the computers, they control all the layers Andres was talking about of the detectors. For example, here I can show you, this is the pulse, what we call the ECAL. ECAL stays for electromagnetic calorimeter. I'm sure that then you will be, you will have uh, even more information about this. And then you see, okay, these are kind of uh, uh, monitoring uh, programs. This is just one of this. Okay, there is the structure, for example, of the detector you see with many buttons. Uh, so you can control, you have alarms. And now this post, uh, there is nobody here. And this is also why I guess we can uh, enter the control room. You see there is another nice uh, screen with pictures and many. Now, let me see if I can get it. Oh, we have also some, you see, monitoring uh, programs running. You see numbers, uh, of course, if you know what you, they, their meaning, you understand if things are going uh, wrong or not. And then there is the other part of the control room where we have uh, the big boss of the group, which is called the, the shift leader. Now he is not so, yeah, here, but he's in the room. Something yeah. really interesting that I can point out yeah. is that yeah. at the moment, uh, so ah, yes, this is a very international collaboration. And <laughs> at the moment, I think it's mostly Italians in the control room. It's just a coincidence, but uh, yeah, we have many, many nationalities around the world. But the it's not because of me, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the shift leader. Kind of. Uh, kind of. <laughs> I'm just a shadow. The shadow, the shadow, the shift leader. You know, we have also the shadow of the shift leader. Our this is okay. Basically, is the captain, captain. Uh, the captain of the, of the of the of the crew. And then, okay, we have some screens uh, showing us uh, the status of the LHC. You can always read. I don't know if you can read on the top. Is written no beam. So this is also something which is interesting for us because we can enter the cavern. And then maybe the last thing I would like to, to show you in, uh, before going down are this kind of uh, event display where we represent, you see, particles, uh, these trucks, for example, particles inside the detector. This is a cross section, okay? So you see two trucks. Now they are changing, of course, because uh, they are different uh, events that we see maybe uh, Andres. Then you can uh, you can explain then the events what they are. Sure. Yes. So you can actually see. Yes. The these stamps, are, so these yeah. are fresh events. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Just to explain a little bit better things. However, these are data from today. You see, taken this uh, morning. Okay, and they are cosmic segments, of course. Uh, the, yeah, and you see. Okay, we have two nice uh, signature for muons. So you see because. Uh, if a particle reaches the edges of the detector, as uh, Andres will explain you, these are muons, only muons. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm ready to go down. So Andres, I leave you the floor again. Okay, and then, thanks. okay, as I have to enter the door, uh, the green door, I will call you back, okay? Okay, so maybe Thank we you. can say a word about, yeah, cosmics and why we built all this stuff down underground, so deep down underground. So uh, at, at this time, as uh, Sonia was saying, we have no collisions, we have no beam in the machine, um, and we're actually taking cosmic data. That means that we are looking at cosmic rays that are hitting our detectors. And 
you know, you might imagine like, well, isn't that why you build a detector 100 meters on the ground uh, to shield it from cosmic rays? Well, it turns out that doesn't work very well. Cosmic rays can very much uh, just penetrate the Earth uh, and actually just go through the entire Earth like no problem. So we actually can see some of these muons. Uh, a lot of very energetic cosmic rays uh, will do some stuff and will decay into muons, will turn into muons, and we can see those uh, with our detector. So we do that um, whenever we don't have any beam and we can use that data, that information for alignment. And I'll get all into all this stuff in a bit, but I'll let Sonia say a word about what she's gonna go, go do right now, right? To connect with what you were saying, this is the reason why as a, a particle physicist, they also want to investigate using cosmic rays. So there is a, a, a tight connection to, uh, to this, and we use the, this uh, uh, data, let's say, for a calibrated detector, as you said, when we do not have beam. Now, okay, I'm ready to enter. So um, I have, of course, my badge from CERN, but I have also this object. This is uh, the personal dosimeter. And uh, basically, uh, it stays on me and uh, is uh, to capture, let's say, to measure the, uh, the, the dose of radiation in case I can collect when I'm in experimental places. So we, I want to say one word on the safety because as a CERN, we are really strict for safety. Uh, this means that uh, there is no radiation or it's very, it's not more than what we have in the natural uh, environment, but uh, we are checked, we are controlled. Now, uh, I will use my personal dosimeter to budge the door here in this place, and then I will enter this green door. I noted that the best <laughs> person who can describe the, the colors of the door is Zoltan, who is following us. So maybe if he wants, I invite him at certain point to, to tell us the meaning of these uh, different colors of the doors. Now, what I have to do, the check, uh, I guess you have seen the angels and, the, and demons uh, movie. This is the door. <laughs> this is the door. So I had to, of course, to do a, a biometrical check to be recognized. This time is a two eyes, not only one, as in the movie. But I have also the two kind of checks to do. One is a weight check, which means, I don't know if you can see, there is a, a, a square which is limited uh, by uh, yellow dots. And this is because this door is, is for people, is not for material. So fortunately, I, they, I cannot read my weight. So I'm really happy about this. But however, the system is checking that I'm a person. And then there is another thing, because of course, the humans are very clever. And so you tell them, you cannot go with materials through this door and they just wear a backpack, okay? So this system <laughs> is also done for this. So if you enter with a backpack, there are infrared beams checking your body. And so you cannot enter with a backpack. I leave also the, 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 the mobile phone, all the, the, the system to the, the, the hands of Noemi because she is a wizard in entering with this stuff. I'm not, so I leave her this, uh, this task and I will check, I will badge just as I'm doing usually. Okay, if uh, the door let me enter, let's see. Right, great. Okay, now we wait for uh, for uh, Noemi. I don't know. Okay. So can you hear me? Well, you well, you guys go in. Maybe I can continue talking about CMS since we're gonna lose you at the elevator. So, um, yeah. And so, so yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. Okay, so they're through. Right. So this area here is the elevator shaft, and. Uh, Andres? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, yeah, 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 no, yeah, yeah, no, sorry. I didn't understand if you uh, wanted to, uh, uh, me to, 
to so, to talk. So I'm uh, just uh, you see the, the 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 now the the elevator is at minus three, which is about minus one hundred, let's say, and then is is coming up. We have three levels. So we have minus one, minus two, and minus three. Basically, minus 80 meters, minus 90 meters, minus 100, more or less. But before the, the elevator comes, I would like to show people this is the door for material. OK, so if we want to enter material, unless we are using the crane, which is bringing down directly the material inside the caverns, we use this door and then the elevator. OK, I think we are ready to go. Uh, you know, Andres, that when I'm in the elevator, a certain point, uh, there will be the network will stop. So I leave you the floor as this happen, and uh, we will uh, we'll start to talk again when uh, I'm uh, uh, again uh, online. Okay, so uh, we should. Okay, I think we lost. Yeah, them. it's a big. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Sultan, should we Hello? go ahead and talk about the detector a little bit? So um, maybe I can go ahead and use the image behind me. Yeah. So as uh, I think, uh, well, we sort of mentioned that this is a cross section of the detector. So this is like if we sliced one of the, you know, the the cylindrical onion in half, and we looked. So the particles, the protons, would be coming in straight into the center here, and we have several layer. That's that's why we call it a cylindrical onion. And right at the center here, we have the innermost part of our detector. So this, just this circle here, or this disk, uh, it's, it's composed of many, many layers of silicon detectors. And what we do is we try to reconstruct the traje trajectory of the particles using this kind of detector. And that is, yeah, what we would call this the tracker. It has many layers. It has an innermost pixel detector. And then around is the tracker detector, and it's, Using uh, silicon sensors is a bit similar to how a camera sensor works, but uh, yeah, we have millions and millions and tens and hundreds of millions of channels to look at that information. So around that, we have in this golden ring here, this is what we call the electromagnetic calorimeter. And then around that, we have in this blue disk over here, we have the hadronic calorimeter. So both of calorimeters are work very differently than the tracker. With the tracker, you try to let the particles travel through on scale. You, you want the particles to not be affected or influenced by the material there, so everything is very lightweight. Whereas in the calorimeter, so again, this gold disc and this blue disc, so these are actually very, very dense, very heavy, and we have layers that where you try to absorb, because you try to absorb the energy of the particles, and we have active material where, which produces light, we call it scintillators, and you collect that light. And the amount of light is roughly proportional to the energy of these particles. So it's interesting that in CMS, outside of these calorimeters, we have this uh, silver colored disc. This is actually the superconducting solenoid. And at this point, to give you a sense of scale, again, this is six meters in inner diameter. Uh, and very cool is that in CMS, most of the interactions, most of the decays, most of the particles that are produced stay within this volume and they don't punch through the magnet. The only particles that do that are muons, which we'll talk about in a second, and also neutrinos, which we will not talk about too much, but if people are curious, we can talk about how we deal with neutrinos in this sort of detector. So, Andres? Yes. I, I, heard, I heard that you were talking about the magnet, and, and as this is uh, what we play with, I was just going quickly close to the entrance uh, of the, the door of the, of the cavern. So uh, I wanted just to show a, a small effect we have outside before entering. So I have, you see, a very expensive detector. Can you, can you see this, guys? So this is a very expensive detector. And this is a detector, please uh, don't laugh. Uh, let's see what happens. You see, it's not magnetized. So let's, uh, let's see what happens. And now I, I start to go. I'm just going uh, through a corridor, which is connecting. Uh, we, have a, we have here two caverns. Uh, one is called the service cavern, where we have all the stuff for the, for the detector to let the detector working as uh, power supplies, uh, electronics, uh, um, or, uh, any other kind of gas, etc. Uh, but then you see it starts. 
uh, but then we have the, the and then we have the, uh, the experimental cavern and this corridor I'm I'm just in is uh, the corridor of, which connects the two and as you see I'm already I, I'm still outside the cavern but I can feel the fringe you see can you see the chain bending this is the fringe magnetic field outside the cavern okay I can make many fancy things as maybe you see I can stick this on the on this I can do many other strange things on the door you see but then I think the funniest thing is this one before going in because of in there, there are strange things is this one and in the meanwhile you play with this I will uh, I will prepare another one, another experiment. This is because there are equations, of course, behind this. But okay, first you enjoy nature, and then you explain with mathematics. You see, this is uh, the magnetic swing we have here. This wall you have here is not magnetic, but the screws they are. And so you see, and the moment that I'm way, I'm really playing with this, uh, I push down, and uh, I have. Uh, a force which will push me up so I can feel it of course uh, you can you should believe me okay and then if I can I can show you another thing very fast before going inside because I found the very funny is something here let's see if I can you see you see this clips here now it's moving let's try to put a steady and then look what happens if I just go close to this clip maybe with another one i have many here so i don't know if i can succeed to have a one single here yes look i'm not touching you see i'm just pushing this object and now if i touch of course it's magnetic you see i don't know if i can clip another one but it goes down but however still it's there and I can feel the magnetic field. I don't know. In this way, I cannot move it, of course. But maybe I can do it in this way. You see? Which is the same principle that you have on the, on the wall. Okay? Now, you have seen what happens outside the cavern with these clips. Let's go in and let's see this, uh, this chain I was showing you before, this one. So you remember? The bending of this chain here, maybe Noemi can already show you. Okay, this is the maximum bending I'm, I'm getting here. Let's see what happens inside. Okay, so Sonia's going to go inside. <laughs> I, all right, so, so Sonia's going to go inside. This uh, booth is very similar to the one she already went through, but it's a different color. So this one, if you try to go in, and the LHC is actually running, it will interlock the LHC. That means that the beams will be dumped and the whole LHC will stop working just because you opened that door. And there's many things, many aspects that are interesting, but let me quickly go back and sort of give you an, a sense of what uh, the magnetic field is gonna be like within the Why, detector volume. So the detector, as I mentioned, has this very, very powerful magnet and it's a superconducting solenoid and it actually, when you cool it down to something like four Kelvin and you pump about 18,000 amperes of current into it, it actually generates about 3.8 Tesla of magnetic field within that uh, solenoid volume, within that magnet. And actually at CMS, we have a lot of iron. And by a lot, I mean like 12,500 tons of iron that surround that magnet. And they actually form what we call the return yoke. So they're actually part of the magnetic system and still provide about two Tesla of magnetic field just outside uh, that magnetic, uh, that, that solenoid. Andres? Yes, Sonia, we can see you. Yeah, no, just to say that, okay, I'm on the way. I, I was able to, to enter, now it's Noemi. Yeah, so you She's can see that checking. Noemi has a key. Yeah. So that key that Noemi is holding is actually, again, a safety requirement. So while this key is missing from its, uh, from its slot, it actually interlocks the LHC as well. So the LHC will not work. Uh, it mechanically cannot work until that key is returned to the LHC. And you can see that it's so basically, to Andres, basically you are telling me that I have the LHC in my hand. 
because I have the key, <laughs> the 29. And then now, okay, also Noemi, she has, she's entering now, so she's checking. Maybe you can see some images, I don't know. I'm waiting already uh, in between. So let me and really I guess quickly, now we have, yes. Yeah, so have so Sonia, really quickly, maybe let me say yeah. that you guys are gonna be able to see the detector, but, and I mentioned it's like several slices, but you're gonna see the detector uh, closed. So I, we will try to identify some of the parts, but we're not gonna be able to see the innermost parts of the detector, but Sonia will, uh, I'll let you guys go in and we can talk about what you guys see and the magnetic field, of course, which is gonna be pretty strong. Yeah, we are, we are changing now some uh, parts of the system uh, for the video because uh, the magnetic field, as you said, inside is strong. Okay, not so strong to, to be dangerous for us, but however, some devices cannot be brought inside and we are changing. We need just some time to, to set up all the stuff. Uh, so just a few minutes, uh, no, even one minute because the so is almost ready. So they have to go handheld because the stabilizer goes crazy when you put it yeah. under that type of magnetic field. And, the and in any itself. case, in fact, you, you will notice at some points, and we apologize in advance, but the camera yeah. itself, it's a, it's a phone camera, and it will have trouble focusing because of the magnetic field. So uh, there will be some sections where the camera goes out of focus. We apologize in advance, but it's just what happens. Yes, this is exactly what happened uh, for some visitors we had in the past. They We were allowed to enter, but okay, we were unfocusing the the, yeah, and, and let me reiterate really quickly how fortunate you guys are. Uh, we're, very few people are allowed to go into the CMS detector. And right now we're in a period of one week where we have a technical stop because LHCB, a different experiment, is installing part of our, their detector. So we're fortunately going to be able to, uh, to show you guys our detector, which is pretty cool. Okay, now you see... Uh, I can I can I just joke on my family name? My family name is Natalia, which means Christmas. You see, I just look like <laughs> a Christmas tree. So I just try to to keep everything on me because I don't want to make put any dangerous uh, stuff around. Even the door, it's very heavy. Okay, now I help Noemi to follow me, and uh, let's see. Now you see, this is. For example, ah, okay, let's ask with the chain, you know? Okay, do you remember our chain? Let's see what happens now. And then you will see also the other objects. Look, look at my chain. So part do of you see any seeing, difference? Yeah, part of do what you you're see seeing any difference? is that the, the chain is actually following the magnetic field lines. So it might be a little hard to tell, but as Sonia moves closer to the center of the detector, the angle of that chain is changing as well. Yes, exactly. And uh, okay, I don't know if you can appreciate, but this chain, uh, because of course uh, we have the magnetic uh, field lines, uh, changes uh, its orientation. Maybe if I put uh, on the on here, I put uh, just the point, you can appreciate a little bit better. You see this point, uh, I don't know if you can appreciate, is is, uh, there is an orientation. It's not just uh, that I move. And then of course I can put here, you see, stay like that. And, but I have uh, other things I can show you. You see, these are much heavier objects, look. And if for you, it's already a lot, this you will see, can we go down also? Okay, we will go on the basement and you will see what happens, happens of this thing. Yeah. So, so if you go they can downstairs, here. yeah, it's much stronger. Yeah, so and then you have another one, this is lighter, you see? So you can see what happens. Now, okay, uh, this you have to believe me, if I move in this way, I can feel, I can, I have to apply a force because you see there is a sort of flipping I'm doing. It. Can you see this? I don't know if uh, so I the, can. The object <laughs> wants to stay in that orientation and yes, align exactly. with the magnetic field lines. And if you deflect so it, it wants change to stay like that or like that. If I force it to stay like that, it, it cannot stay. It goes down. You see, I have many other objects. You see, okay, I can sell you all these objects. 
I have the key, I guess, uh, you see, this is uh, nice because uh, here the key is not magnetic, but the, the, the pin it is. So you see, you see a little bit of this uh, flipping and this is uh, completely down because uh, there are two different uh, materials. And the last thing, and then we go down, I should have another device, which is this one. So you see, this is, uh, you know, I, I don't know the name of this object you use uh, on the mobile phones. I don't know how to yes. call it, okay? So you see, this is magnetic, but the chain is not. You see the chain? The chain is completely free, while this one, you see, it's rigid, it's bending a little bit. Not too much, but it's bending. So, okay, I think we so, can go down in the yeah, meanwhile, so you can take the floor, yeah. Sonia and Noemi are currently in the visitor's platform. You can actually see right now that the camera is a little bit out of focus. Uh, but yeah, the field in the visitors or within the visitors platform, if I recall quite correctly, is something like 30 milli Tesla, something like that. So it's going to be significantly more powerful as they go along. Something that, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll let Sonia describe the experience, but I also wanted to talk about the detector since we're here. So you can see this, this orange, um, we call this this orange uh, tube looking thing, that's uh, the shielding for the very forward sections of the detector, but it's not, there's very few detector components there. Now you can see these uh, yellow stacks or yellow uh, platforms. So those are holding up the hydronic forward section of the detector. So that is actually, let's call it the end caps of the calorimeter, sort of, of the hydronic calorimeter in particular. And then you see this, this red disc uh, which you, you'll get a, a better view of it. Uh, it's sort of the end cap of the detector itself. And that is a layer of muon detectors, specifically their uh, RPCs or resistive plate chambers. And we'll talk about the muon detectors in a bit and all the rest of the detectors. We only sort of scratch the surface with them. But you can see here, this is really the final con configuration of the detector when it's all sealed up and ready to detect particles. Uh, Andres, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, I'm in the basement, you see? Now, okay, uh, I so am this my- is 97 meters underground right now. <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, we, we should say that under the, 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 the detector, we have other electronics, we go, we go even deeper. Now, okay, you see that I'm wearing uh, special shoes. Uh, these are, of course, uh, to protect myself, but there is some uh, iron. So it will be very hard because I will feel exactly the same flipping uh, uh, because my, my shoes, maybe they want to align with the magnetic field. I will try yeah, to so be it's careful. It's a safety feature. Yeah. It's, it's uh, steel-toed boots, but it also, they're difficult to navigate uh, in a strong magnetic field. Now, yeah. I know that uh, I, maybe Noemi, she cannot come very close to here. So you see, I have, for example, here, it's really nice. I can feel the magnetic field. I, if I follow, if I follow the magnetic field, look my feel, my feet. I had to go like that. <laughs> this I'm aligned to the magnetic field. Now let's see what happens of the chain. I don't know if you can see this. You see? Maybe I can put also here. I don't know if it's possible. Look, this is horizontal. I don't know if you can catch it, but I can put. Uh, Something, this is, uh, you see, aligned. Okay, no, now, now I'm cheating. Okay, now this, let's do like that. In this way, you see? So it's horizontal. And then I have other, these other things, you know, I have really to keep very strong because uh, look, can you see? This is aligned like that. And if I try to put 90 degree, I medium and flip in the other side, you see? You see here the oscillation. This is not myself. It's really the magnetic field. I, I see also here that I have uh, somebody left this. This is not from me. So it's a victim of another visit, maybe. You can see here, it's really nice. So I leave this free to align the two, you see? Let's, let's do like that. You see now, it was not like that uh, when we were on the balcony. And look, 
look at what happens. <laughs> it's really nice. <laughs> you see, I, I, I hope you can feel as me, the magnetic field. It's really, it's really strong. Okay, maybe what I can do here, I can profit it. I think I can leave them uh, to take off one pin here. And you know, there is also one strange thing. Uh, I have hear rings here. They are uh, <laughs> made of magnetic things. I don't know because it's not a real uh, thing. It's iron. I don't know. I feel uh, my ears uh, going <laughs> aligned to the to the detector. It's really crazy. And then, okay, the last thing maybe I can do here. I remember we did. I don't know if uh, it flipped. Where is it? Ah, okay, it's here. I cannot. I don't know if. I, okay, I can put here. I don't know if I can put here. Okay, you see, they stick in this way because everything is magnetic. I even don't know they are so rigid that I don't know if I can even do the same playing as as before. You see, I cannot do, but just because it's really strong, so they really stick here. Maybe okay, we can talk about this system. This would be useful yes. because. So, uh, Sonia, since uh, we're having you. a very good look uh, at the yeah. orange feed, maybe we can yeah, say a word exactly. about them. Yeah. So uh, okay. I, I mentioned earlier that there are a few dozen, or right. on the order of a dozen slices in CMS, and these orange feet are actually used to pump uh, compressed air down and have to reduce the friction enough. It's not like the whole thing levitates, but it is. Uh, you can pump enough compressed air so that you reduce the friction and then you can move these slices very slowly and very carefully. But that's how we open up the detector. We basically uh, just open it up like an accordion. And of course, there's a lot of preparation required. There's many, many details. The, uh, for example, the fact that the, the, the cavern where Sonia is in right now, the floor is inclined just the slightest bit. So these machines uh, are used to pull the, the slices we have to be very careful and take into account whether you're going downhill or uphill and just be very careful and do things very, very slowly. Andres, we can add, okay, I can show you also the, the small, I don't know, I call them crane, but I don't know, maybe there is a, a, another uh, special name where you were talking about the cables, okay? And uh, these are the cables pulling uh, the, the slices, the wheel of the detector. Can you see them? Yes. I don't know if it's, uh, yeah, okay. So these are the cables. Basically, you use these cables here, and then uh, you attach this cable to the, to the wheel. Uh, we are going uh, toward, uh, towards now, and then you pull. Okay, if I can simulate the, the movement is exactly like that. Okay, as they are attached, you pull. And when you had, and so you open the detector. When you had to close the detector, I can show you there is another, object uh, where we have other cables. Uh, it's in the inner part here. You see, I hope I can go. I don't know if you can focus. This is another one. And we have, uh, we attach the cable here and uh, to close, we pull on the, on the opposite side. So basically it's always uh, pulling uh, the wheels and never pushing. And here there is a stair and we can access uh, the electronics uh, I was talking about under the detector. Okay, we are just, uh, we are now going, uh, we are in the middle. Basically so on the you, top of my head, tell, we have uh, the, the collision point. Very, very out of focus. This is where the magnetic field is strongest at the moment. Uh, so they're very, very close to the magnet. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, right now they're very, very close to the muon and the muon barrel, and again yeah, within correct. the muon uh, or the return yoke, the magnetic field is about two tesla. So now they're I'm going on to the opposite, opposite side. side, right? And yes, exactly. You can see that our, you're going to be able to see that our detectors are very symmetric. Yes. So May I say it's yeah, a it's ahead. a it's a it's a cake, a cylindrical cake you cut in slices. <laughs> Can I use this uh, comparison? I'm sure there is a, a cake which has a, a cylindrical shape and you cut in slices. 
So this is the typical shapes we use for detectors uh, on colliders, just because you have the two beam coming from the opposite side. So you want to, to capture all the information or everything which happens in the center. We could also build a sphere, but you understand that the sphere already, this is a five, uh, a five uh, floor building. Uh, it's not easy to manage from the mechanical point of view. Um, now you know what I, I would like to do, uh, Andres. I go back and I would like just to show the shaft that, of course, is closed, but just to, to show where you are from the bottom. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. Is it? So Sonia's going to Yeah, so I'm walk going back. back. And you can kind of get a sense of the size of the detector. So in this configuration, if I recall correctly, our detectors roughly like 30 meters long, something around about that. Uh, and then, yeah, about 50 meters tall. And hopefully you guys, the camera can out of- Okay, Andres, I'm just under your feet. If you look down, maybe you can see me through the, <laughs> through the, the floor. I can see the shaft. I don't know if you can see, you see a structure, a yellow structure. This is a crane. And then you see uh, a, a darker zone. This is the shaft from where the detector was, was lower. And the, just on the top of this uh, uh, shaft, you have, there is the, the floor where Andres is standing up in this moment. So, you know, we are just, we have a separation of 100 meters more or less Andres now. Yep, 97 meters. <laughs> yes, 97 meters. <laughs> it depends if you if you measure from the from my feet, the bottom, or from the the top of my head, which changes uh, slightly, not too much, but slightly. <laughs> slightly, yes. Uh, do you want me to show something more here? So can we or can see? Can I go back? Maybe no. Yes, we can she see some of the infrastructure, some of the cables that you can see near the end cap. So if you look at the muon RPC end cap, there are the, all these blue cables, the for example. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you can see some of the- We are just going. Right, so you can see a lot of infrastructure and I'm afraid I, I couldn't tell you exactly what everything is, but I just wanted to point out that there are so many uh, cables that carry high voltage or low voltage. There are cables that provide certain kind of gases. So the muon system uses very specific mixtures of gases that have to be pro provided very carefully. The magnet itself needs liquid helium. That means there's a lot of cables provided for that. So you can barely tell here, but there's uh -huh. a bunch of red cables, blue cables. Red cables are usually high voltage. And then the, 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 there's green cables and sometimes these correspond okay. to different subsystems. <laughs> There, there's a large number of uh, cables and a lot of infrastructure, uh, a lot of fiber optics that return the signals from the detector. And you can see these little, these gaps, right? So this is the gap between two slices. And it gives you an idea, when we talk about a, our um, detector, we say no, I mean, it's called a compact muon solenoid. And you can see it's not compact, it's very large, but it is very dense. It really fits together and there's barely any gaps. So even between the slices, there's just a little bit of space wow. between them. And uh, yeah, you can see fibers for the RPC trigger. Yeah. We didn't even talk about the trigger. The trigger is like the way that we filter out the events. We get too many collisions too often and we cannot keep them all. So we try to only retain or record the more interesting ones. And the RPC, the, this is one of the neon system that helps us do that. Andres? Right, so Andres, can you maybe hear, this yeah. is a good time can you hear to me? ask if, yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Yeah, yeah, really no, I wanted to just to questions. say something. Okay, because you see, yeah, you have seen, okay, how big is this detector? You have seen, we have tried to show also the complexity in the inner part, uh, in the meanwhile, you were talking about cables and a little bit of tr about trigger. Um, I would like just to, to stress that these, uh, Maybe this huge structure, a building on five floor as a diameter and a building on about eight, eight floor in the length, this object has an alignment at the level of the microns. So each part 
is aligned with respect to the, the, the next one or, or the one which is close by at the level of microns, which is less than uh, this, uh, the cross section of the human, uh, human air. Sonia. So yeah. you, Sorry you to interrupt, Sonia. Yeah. Um, yeah? So we, the students actually have to get going. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but they actually have to leave right now. Uh, so I was wondering if there are questions that they would like to ask before they have to yeah, leave. Yeah, yeah, but I had to finish. Okay, I was fi it was ended. It was just this one. Nothing more. <laughs> so you guys from outside, do you want to ask any questions? You can just unmute and go ahead. Can we go back? Yeah, that's fine. So we have one question here. Um, where is the, the service template? Like, the... You want me to show you a picture of what's up? Oh, okay. Well, all right. You so... showed us once in class, like this kind of like the tunnel. Oh, okay. They're asking where the LAC tunnel is. <laughs> well, the LAC tunnel, the tunnel. So actually, Noemi, maybe you can show the orange shielding okay. again. Oh, okay, so Naomi can't hear us, but you can kind of see this orange tube, the shielding here. And if you keep going towards the right, that's the LHC tunnel. Now, we very much cannot access the LHC tunnel, uh, generally speaking. Um, only like very specially trained people access the tunnel. I've only been in the tunnel once in my entire life, and it was during the open days. So it's very inaccessible and very few people get to go and check it out. Um, so we cannot Andres, show you the tunnel. I go Sorry. out, Andres, yep, I go that, out. That's fine, and Sonia, I can please show, go ahead. I, no, I, I can show the door, another access door, but we cannot enter this door, which has the shape of the LHC. So this I can show. I go out and I would show this in a few minutes. Yeah, so the, the LHC, uh, the images of the, I have in, one in front of me right now, for example. So. You see these iconic blue tubes? Those are the dipoles we were talking about. And there's many of them, but uh, I don't know, there's many, many interesting things, but among them is the fact that the LHC is not really a circle, right? Uh, it's actually a series of straight sections. And then you have these dipole magnets where the, the straight section bends a little bit. So it's really like a very many, many sided polygon and you have the dipoles where the tunnel bends. Um, but this is sort of the iconic picture of the tunnel. You see it sort of have some bend to it and you see the dipole magnets. Unfortunately, we, we can't really show you that. I wish we could show you that. I would be very excited to go in the LHC tunnel actually. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I think th th there is one. Um, how long does it, do you have to wait um, after um, they turn the beam off? Do you have to wait until we can go in? How long do you need to wait? Right, so actually when Sonia showed you this television uh, image and it said no beam, you could actually read some comments. So that's what we call page one of the OHC and that's where we have all the information. So it actually said something about RP surveys and uh, anytime there's beam in the machine and you, uh, you know, you want to access the experiment or the, or the LHC tunnel, there are, first of all, many, many radi radi radiation sensors everywhere that are measuring radioactivity levels at all times. But then once things are safe, there's a team that goes in and checks exactly in very different positions. They check what the radioactivity levels are and they can clear uh, these things very, very precisely. And even then, when you go in, you have to very carefully specify who's going in, where they're going, what how long it's going to take, what tools are going to use, if they're going to remove any materials, that sort of thing. Uh, Sultan, any more you want to add? I just wanted to, to add that th this kind of radiation sweep happened today as well in the morning, and that allows us to, to go in. So without that, no virtual visit in the cavern. Yeah, and just to very quickly give you a bit more context. So there has been three years, we're just finishing a, a period of three years of upgrades and maintenance. And we actually had some collisions last year, but these were sort of preliminary or what we call test beam collisions. Uh, we are, we just had, we're in the process of beam commissioning and we had what we call splashes. We haven't had collisions yet. That's scheduled for June 2nd for now. And then July 5th, this is where we're gonna, we're gonna start really the full on 
collisions. So July 5th, mark it on your calendar. It will be on the news for sure. Sonia, go ahead. Andres, yes, I wanted just to show, to, to, to give at least, uh, as we cannot enter the LHC uh, tunnel, okay, this is a door which brings through a corridor to the LHC tunnel, which connects to the orange, uh, on the other side of the orange stuff we have seen. As you see, we start with the shape of this. This is bigger than the LHC tunnel, I should say. And this door, maybe you can, okay, I can show you, this is sealed. So we are not allowed to enter. Uh, this means that you, if you use it, it's just because of, of an escape, a second escape path, but you should have a, a good reason to open this, okay? Yeah, otherwise, okay, we are not allowed. So it's here for safety, but we cannot, uh, in principle, use. And if, if people want to access to the LHC because they work there, they use other access points, not this one. Okay, I continue going back to come up to the surface. Okay, so uh, we're going to let you guys ask any more questions. There's a million things that I could talk about, but please let us know if... Uh, there if is questions. electronics we here. Andres? Yes, so from outside, are, are there any questions? Are there any more questions? There's none. Okay, all right, it looks like there is, there is none. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have one question. Um, so uh, what is the highest energy that you reached so far? Did you uh, break any records? Excellent question. Part? <laughs> yes, uh, so you've been looking at this for sure. Uh, so the LHC uh, has operated at different energies. And I mentioned before that the magnets are the limiting factor. So if you were looking at the news in 2009, you noticed that we had a bit of a disaster. I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, there was kind of an explosion that involved the magnets. So the entire LHC uh, operational period has gradually been an increase in energy because the magnet had to be treated very carefully. And during this three-year period of long uh, maintenance and upgrades, the magnet interconnects in particular were, were redone. So during what we call run two, so if you go back three years ago when we had collisions, we, were, we, we accelerated protons to 13 TeV, and that was the center of mass energy, uh, the kind of collisions we had, which was a record at the time. So after this period of, um, of you know, upgrading and, and repairing those interconnects, the LHC managed to ramp up to 13.6 TV, which is a new world record. Uh, so this is what we were expecting in terms of energy, center mass energy collisions uh, during run three. And I think also for high Lumia LHC, it's probably gonna be that amount. Um, and this happened very recently. Now, keep in mind that this is a world record in terms of circulating beam. So we didn't have collisions at the time, but it's still, yeah, it's still a record. So uh, there's many, many, uh, yeah, uh, lots of cool things coming. Uh, and as I said, between June 2nd, that's gonna be cool, but really July 5th is, is where we're gonna see a lot of LHC stuff in the news. Thank you so much. That's, we're gonna be marking it on our calendars and I'll share the links with my students. and. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think yeah, there are no more questions. Um, I, I, I guess on our end, we'll just... Um, oh, there's one more. Is there any reason that they keep those like big servers underground rather than above ground? With, sorry, I'll, I'll have my student say the question himself. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, no, you're fine. Okay. So they can hear me. Yeah, they can hear you. Is there any reason you guys keep the like the big servers and those like I just saw like briefly? Um, is there any reason you guys keep those underground rather than above ground, or is there just a design question? So what you were seeing, uh, well, first of all, there are some lots of electronics, lots of stuff inside of the experimental cavern, and then there is a seven meter thick concrete wall that separates the experiment itself from the what we call the service room or counting room and this is where you probably saw I think Sonia was trying to show us the service cavern and, and all these racks full of electronics but we're running out of time so what 
so we have a lot of electronics there and a lot of it is readout electronics and some power supplies. So the main reason that they're very close to the detector is just to reduce latency and uh, this kind of uh, high voltage supplies, for example, you don't wanna have long lengths of cable. But uh, one thing to keep in mind is that what you saw is what's providing the experiment infrastructure, right? So there's a lot of stuff in those service caverns parts of which you didn't see, which is, for example, the cryogenics for the superconducting solenoid. Now, I mentioned it's sort of the tip of the iceberg because like upstairs, we have a computer farm and that's part of the trigger system, but it's, there's several stages to the trigger system. And one of them involves just sending the data through a bunch of computers, a computer farm that just crunches the numbers and gives us a, a bit more detailed look at what happened during the solutions and help us select them or reject them. Um, so that's the short answer. There's, there's much more to say, but uh, yeah. All right, looks like Andres, back. Yeah, I'm back. No, I wanted just to, I, I was following you in the answers, so just to say, yes, I tried to show some cables, but as we were running out of time of cables, optical fibers. Uh, so it's the brain of our part of the brain of the detector. Now we reach you closer. Uh, your post. So I think we're almost uh, ready to close. Just to say, let yes. Me, let me ask again if there's any additional questions and, but we're all set up here, I guess. I think we are all done with our <laughs> questions here. Oh my goodness, perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, thank you so much, Andres, Sonia, Zoltan, uh, Noemi. Thank you, this has been great. It was all our pleasure and hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks so much. And thank you to Sultan and Noemi again. They're, they're well, the nice to meet you. Yeah. yeah, they are there. <laughs> thank you so much again. I mean, we really appreciate this. Have a wonderful evening. You too. You. Yeah. You too. Bye. <laughs>